You're listening to Quantum Harry the Podcast, a podcast version of the book Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse by B. L. Purdom. Episode 10, All's Fair in War and Quidditch. During the last eight episodes, I've talked about J.K. Rowling's game pieces, the archetypes ruling the seven books in the Harry Potter series. I'll be mentioning these archetypes in some way in nearly every episode that follows, so if you ever feel lost or confused about archetypes, just return to the early episodes. To recap, Episode 2, This Old Man, covers the archetype of the wise old man, and Dumbledore is the character who best embodies this archetype in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Other characters embodying this archetype include Ollivander, the Weasley twins, Victor Crumb, and Mr. Lovegood. Episode 2 also covered the Godfather variant of the wise old man, and characters embodying this archetype, besides Dumbledore, include Sirius Black and Ron Weasley. In episode 8, I also talked about how the Smith, a term from George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones universe, is another subset of this archetype and applies to many archetypal wise old men that have been mentioned because they create weapons of some sort. Episode 3, Iron Maiden, covers the archetype of the Maiden, and Ginny Weasley is the character who best embodies this archetype in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. This episode also examined other Maidens, including Parvati Patil, Nymphadora Tonks, and Fleur Delacour. Episode 4, Mother May I, covers the archetype of the Mother, and Hermione Granger is the character who best embodies this archetype in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. This episode also examined other archetypal mothers, including Molly Weasley, Narcissa Malfoy, Dolores Umbridge, Petunia Dursley, Lily Potter, and Rubius Hagrid, a male character embodying a female archetype. Episode 5, Our Father, covers the archetype of the Father. Cedric Diggory is the character who best embodies this archetype in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. This episode also examined other fathers, including Neville Longbottom, James Potter, Arthur Weasley, and Barty Crouch Sr. Episode 6, A Murder of Crones, covers the archetype of the Crone. Little Lovegood is the character who best embodies this archetype in Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. I also covered other archetypal crones, including Sybil Trelawney, Mrs. Fig, Bellatrix Lestrange, and another male character embodying a female archetype, Severus Snape. Episode 7, Fountain of Youth, covers the archetype of the youth, and Draco Malfoy is the character who best embodies this archetype in Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. I also examined other youths, Dean Thomas, Remus Lupin, and Harry himself, And in episode 8, I talked about how the warrior aspect of the seven-faced god in Game of Thrones can be seen as a variant of the youth archetype, as the godfather and the smith are variants of the wise old man. Episode 8, Have You Tried Not Being Liminal? And episode 9, We're Here, We're Metaphorically Queer, together address the archetype of the metaphorically queer liminal being. Voldemort is the character who best embodies this archetype in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, though Remus Lupin, Bill Weasley, Hermione Granger, Dobby the House Elf, Sirius Black, Hagrid, Snape, Dumbledore, and Harry himself, among many other characters, also embody this archetype in the Harry Potter series. I also talked about the similarities between the Seven-Faced God in Game of Thrones and the seven archetypes each ruling one of the books in the Harry Potter series, particularly the seventh aspect of the God, the Stranger, which shares many attributes with the seventh archetype, the metaphorically queer liminal being. These eight episodes are the podcast equivalent of the first seven chapters of Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse. This episode, number 10, and the next episode comprise another two-episode arc and are the podcast equivalent of chapter 8 of the book. The first chapter covering the way that games, toys, sweets, and fairy tales shape the narrative of one of the seven books. In this case, the first book in the series, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Episode 1, however, was the podcast equivalent of the introduction to the book, and we'll return to that introduction now for a moment. In episode 1, The Kids' Table, I talked about the overarching theme running throughout the seven-book Harry Potter series. Games, toys, sweets, fairy tales, childhood, and children in general. But more specifically, people disregarding the importance of these things to their peril. 
and the world outside of Harry Potter, the disregard many people have for books read by children, because they consider them to be only for children, is similar to other knee-jerk judgments people have had about Harry Potter, such as labeling the Harry Potter books evil because there's magic in them, or calling the series simplistic, two-dimensional, and otherwise not worthy of adults' attention, either to analyze, as many people other than me do on a regular basis, or to read for pleasure, at least if you're over the age of 10. With the exception of professional sports, and even then, some people do look down on adults who think they are grasping at childhood when they play or watch sports, games are also often dismissed in our world. Gamers get even less respect, if possible, and are often stereotyped as adult male college graduates or dropouts living in their parents' basements playing World of Warcraft and never seeing daylight. Yet Jane McGonagall maintains in her book, Reality is Broken, why games make us better and how they can change the world, that we need to make reality more like games. J.K. Rowling may or may not agree, but she structured her seven book series around toys, fairy tales, games, and the equipment for games, and the archetypes that I call Rowling's game pieces. According to Jane McGonagall, the four defining traits of a game are that it should have a goal, rules, a feedback system, so you know how close you are to the goal, and voluntary participation. However, she cites Bernard Snitz's definition of a game as more succinct. Quote, playing a game is the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles, unquote. This is very much how J.K. Rowling uses games in the Harry Potter books. The reader experiences this as a realization that Harry or another character is attempting to overcome an evidently unnecessary obstacle, and seems to be doing so voluntarily. This is probably because the character in question is playing a game. In Reality is Broken, McGonagall writes, If the goal is truly compelling, and if the feedback is motivating enough, we will keep wrestling with the game's limitations, creatively, sincerely, and enthusiastically, for a very long time. We will play until we utterly exhaust our own abilities, or until we exhaust the challenge. And we will take the game seriously, because there is nothing trivial about playing a good game. The game matters. Part of the appeal of the Harry Potter books could be that Harry is a surrogate player for the reader. And in turn, when people purchase the video games based on the books and films, players get to be surrogates for Harry or Hermione or Ron, voluntarily overcoming unnecessary obstacles, working toward a goal, following the rules, and hoping that the feedback will report that the player is coming closer to the goal. Whether reading books or playing a game, the reader or player gets to play along with Harry, and millions around the world have done exactly that. In both this episode and the next, we'll look at the role of toys, sweets, and games in the first Harry Potter book. Let's start with a quote from Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Chapter 11, Quidditch. Harry learnt that there were 700 ways of committing a Quidditch foul, and that all of them had happened during a World Cup match in 1473. The Seekers were usually the smallest and fastest players, and that most serious Quidditch accidents seemed to happen to them. That although people rarely died playing Quidditch, referees had been known to vanish and turn up months later in the Sahara Desert. Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone introduces the reader to Harry and the Wizarding World. In the initial chapter, a holiday that's fun and games for children, Halloween, turns deadly for Harry's parents. Soon after, Voldemort's attempt to also kill Harry backfires, and when news of this spreads, war segues into play for wizards, who celebrate by setting off magical sparks mistaken for shooting stars and early fireworks in celebration of Bonfire Night, the national holiday of the United Kingdom that is another instance of war, or rather, rebellion against the state, the gunpowder plot, becoming a playful celebration enjoyed by all. This is the only literal mention of Bonfire Night in the Seven Book series. From what we see, or rather don't see, this is a purely Muggle holiday. I have my own theories about why that is, but that will have to wait until I'm talking about the role of games, toys, and fairy tales in the fifth book. In Philosopher's Stone's first chapter, Rowling introduces readers to Harry's uncle and guardian, Vernon Dursley, married to Harry's mother's sister, his aunt Petunia. Vernon is no fan of imagination or laughter that's not at someone else's expense, nor people dressing in funny clothes, such as the wizards who are celebrating Voldemort's fall. 
Dumbledore's introduction contrasts him directly with Vernon Dursley. Not only is his taste in dress likely to produce a far more derogatory comment from Vernon than merely funny, he's fond of sweets. Sweets become weapons in Fred and George Weasley's war against Umbridge, Fred and George also being wise old men, the same archetype as Dumbledore. While waiting on Privet Drive for Hagrid, Dumbledore offers a suite to Professor Minerva McGonagall. The passwords giving access to his office also happen to be sweets. Dumbledore is very fond of his famous wizard card, which children collect. On the train, Ron indirectly introduces Harry to his future general in the war, Dumbledore, through the chocolate frog card, a child's plaything that comes with a sweet. Most people don't take toys, games, sweets, or fairy tales seriously, and also don't take seriously some of the people Dumbledore esteems most highly, such as Hagrid, but Dumbledore values all of these things. In the next chapter, ten years have passed, and Harry learns that he's a wizard. His young life has seldom contained games. For ten years, he's been bullied by his cousin Dudley, plus his Aunt Petunia, Uncle Vernon, and sometimes Aunt Marge and her dogs. He lives in a cupboard. He's fed very little. He has no friends. Dudley has bullied other kids out of wanting to be his friend. A year earlier, for his 10th birthday, Harry received a wire coat hanger and an old sock of Vernon's. Dudley's birthday gifts include video games, a television, video cameras, and sports equipment that he's unlikely to use. He has a second bedroom to hold broken toys and games, plus unread books, and it's significant that this is where Harry comes to live when he leaves the cupboard, in the repository for old games and toys, the space for unread fairy tales and other children's books, since Dudley is unlikely to have books for adults being the same age as Harry. Despite his birthday bounty, Dudley's favorite game is chasing and beating up Harry, which is more like war than a game to Harry, who has grown up with games for Dudley, morphing into wars for him. He was weaned on this. Harry does not get to have games for game's sake. When the Hogwarts letter arrives, Harry is starved for games that are only games, starved for a normal childhood. Though inherently whole and complete, Harry is actually incomplete while he's with the Dursleys, who have deprived him of things Dudley takes for granted, loving caretakers, games, toys, and a carefree childhood devoid of threats to life and limb. He's also incomplete while ignorant of the truth about himself and his parents. Trying to steal a letter from his uncle that's addressed to Harry becomes a game that, like his relationship with Dudley, is also a war. But his strategizing doesn't produce the result he wants. He rises early to get the post, but his uncle has risen even earlier and reaches the letterbox first. Vernon continues the game, having them all flee across the country to avoid the letters. He drives erratically, doubling back on his route, having them stay in places that make Dudley howl for his television and computer, on which he likes to blow up things. Dudley's games are all warlike. But this is no game to Vernon. He's fighting a war. Vernon is, of course, going to lose. When Hagrid hand delivers Harry's school letter, a new world opens to him. It is a moment of sublime completion for Harry to finally know who and what he is. In the language of Joseph Campbell's hero cycle, Hagrid is the Herald. Campbell writes, The Herald, or announcer of the adventure, is often dark, loathly, or terrifying, judged evil by the world. This is definitely the case with Hagrid, especially when he's vilified for being a half-giant. But Harry quickly takes to him. He's the first person he's seen do magic since he was a baby, and to him it's the best game ever. It takes him through a wall to Diagon Alley. It gives Dudley a curly pink pig's tail, and it gives Harry a new self. He'll eventually learn not to view magic as a game, but this is an understandable initial reaction. Hagrid tells Harry that the purpose of the Ministry of Magic is to keep muggles in the dark about magic, telling him that everyone would want magical solutions to their problems. It's as if wizards are concerned that muggles, whom they regard much like small children, would think of magic like a game, something to treat lightly, as many wizards do. It's unclear whether they feel that muggles are more prone to do this or just as prone as wizards. One of the most pressing messages of the books is that magic is not frivolous, let alone Harry's most important attribute. His wholeness and his ability to love are far more important. 
This is another reason that criticism of the books due to the inclusion of magic is entirely missing the point. Harry's letter says that first years cannot have brooms at school, though they will have flying lessons, and many students from wizard families have probably already flown on brooms. However, if we consider a broom as a weapon, it makes sense for this toy, used for transport and for a dangerous warlike game, to be withheld from the youngest students except when they're supervised. In Diagon Alley, Hagrid takes Harry to Gringotts, the Wizarding Bank, which is tantamount to taking him to an amusement park where he's given gold just for being him, a dream come true game that's been turned into a video game, allowing Harry Potter fans to put themselves in his place. As is the pattern throughout the books, the game of riding through Gringotts in a small tram car past various obstacles to reach the gold is potentially dangerous. What neither we nor Harry learn until later is that Professor Quirrell breaks into the bank on the same day to try to steal the Philosopher's Stone before Hagrid can complete his errand and deliver it to Dumbledore. This means that at the beginning and end of the book, Harry is racing with Quirrell to reach the stone, though Harry doesn't know this at the start, and at the end he thinks he's in a race with Snape. His entrance into the bank is accompanied by a rhyme that seems flippant on the surface, but is quite serious. Enter, stranger, but take heed of what awaits the sin of greed, for those who take but do not earn must pay most dearly in their turn. So if you seek beneath our floors a treasure that was never yours, thief, you have been warned, beware of finding more than treasure there. This isn't the only game during Harry's trip to Diagon Alley. Draco Malfoy first mentions Quidditch to Harry in Madame Malkin's Robe Shop. This foreshadows many things, Draco taking Neville's Remembrall, which Harry retrieves, landing him on the Gryffindor Quidditch team, the Midnight Duel Challenge, Draco and Harry facing each other in the Dueling Club in the next book, and Harry and Draco being rival seekers in the second book. Draco being the first to mention the most prominent wizarding game, and the one that informs much of the action in the seventh book, though literal Quidditch is technically absent from it, doesn't just set up these conflicts, it positions him as Harry's enemy in general. The word Quidditch being introduced by an enemy is important. He throws down a challenge to Harry, who must rise to this challenge throughout the series. Though Harry is not permitted a broom, he acquires another weapon in Diagon Alley, a wand. Harry still considers magic as something of a game, and little occurs in Diagon Alley to dissuade him from this view. The wand is equipment for this game, though potentially quite dangerous. Like most powerful objects, a wand is about potential. It matters how it is used, and cannot be considered good or evil on its own, though more than one person makes this sort of judgment concerning the Elder Wand. Mr. Ollivander tells Harry that the wand that chooses Harry has the same core as Voldemort's because Dumbledore's phoenix, Fox, has provided the feathers in each. In the fourth and seventh books, we learn other wand game rules, such as the importance of the relationship between wand and wizard, especially whether a wand recognizes a wizard as its master, as well as the relationship between wands, like when Harry's and Voldemort's wands link in the fourth book. These two wands, being brothers, will not work against each other. This is metaphorical quantum entanglement. The wands are entangled, like Harry and Voldemort themselves, because their cores were once part of the same entity, Fox. And finally, a wizard cannot be harmed by a wand that recognizes him as its master, since master and wand are also entangled, but we don't learn about that until later. Ron is the second person to discuss Quidditch with Harry. In contrast to Draco, this binds Harry and Ron as friends and comrades, since Quidditch is metaphorical war and they eventually become teammates. Ron is enthusiastic about the game and wants Harry to love it as much as he does. Draco challenges Harry and is neither friendly nor inclusive. Draco and Ron are doppelgangers, as are Draco and Harry, for different reasons, and this is seen in the contrast in how they discuss Quidditch with Harry. They're both of the wizarding world and interested in their sport, but one cautiously sizes up the newcomer as a potential adversary while the other shares his love of the game without considering whether the pointers he gives could be used against his side. When they're on the train, Ron doesn't know which houses he and Harry will be in. For all they know, they could end up cheering for different house teams for seven years. 
Another game in the first book that's played by both Ron and Hagrid is the name game. In other words, saying he who shall not be named or you know who instead of Voldemort. Neither Dumbledore nor Harry play this game, and Ron is impressed by what he perceives as Harry's bravery, though Harry simply hasn't been conditioned to play this game as Ron was. Harry not accepting the basic rules of the name game becomes an issue in the seventh book. Hagrid is another doppelganger for Harry in the first book. He instantly recognizes Harry as an outsider, though in a slightly different way than the friendly half-giant. Hagrid was expelled from Hogwarts, and Harry is worried about this happening to him when he disregards Madame Hooch's instructions to stay on the ground during the flying lesson. The contrast between sharing power and abusing power is highlighted here when Draco Malfoy steals Neville Longbottom's Remembral and Harry gets it back. Draco, the son of a Death Eater, steals the Remembral, and this is an echo of the attack that took Neville's parents' minds, which is an inarguable abuse of power. And as mentioned in episode 5, Our Father, this incident also foreshadows the first task of the Triwizard Tournament, in which Harry uses his broom to catch an egg from a dragon, an egg that is a stand-in for a snitch, while in the incident from the first book, Harry is trying to catch a snitch equivalent from someone whose name means dragon, Draco. Harry and Neville are also doppelgangers, because either of them could have fulfilled the prophecy, and Voldemort is, directly or indirectly, responsible for each boy growing up without his parents. Harry's response to Draco could be seen as an abuse of power. The students were told to stay on the ground. But he doesn't seek power for himself, and he fully expects to be punished, expelled even, when Professor McGonagall marches him off to the castle. Neville is powerless, unable to control his broom or keep his property, while Harry shares his power by retrieving the Remembral. In addition to this foreshadowing the first task of the Triwizard Tournament, this also foreshadows an inversion of this scene in Order of the Phoenix, when Neville attempts to help Harry with the Prophecy Orb in the Department of Mysteries. Part of the inversion is that while Harry succeeds in saving the Remembral, Neville fails to preserve the orb. Both the Remembral and the Orb are linked to memory. The Remembral is supposed to help Neville remember things, and the Prophecy Orb contains the memory of the prophecy that could have involved either boy, until Voldemort chose Harry. The snitch Harry catches in his first match is also linked to memory, since Dumbledore encases the Resurrection Stone inside this snitch and leaves it to Harry in his will. The snitch remembers Harry, and this allows him to open it when he is about to die, so he can use the Resurrection Stone to call up the shades slash memories of people he loved and lost, who accompany him as he walks to his death. In Half-Blood Prince, Cornelius Fudge says to his muggle counterpart, The trouble is, the other side can do magic too, Prime Minister. This is why Quirrell is correct to say, There is no good or evil, only power. The Prime Minister can't understand why wizards are having trouble with Voldemort, but the answer is simple, different attitudes towards power. Fudge verbalizes the conflict at the center of the sixth book, the problem Harry has to solve before the end of Deathly Hallows. It's important that the prophecy says that Harry is the one with the power, not the destiny, to defeat Voldemort. He has a power that Voldemort knows not. We could call it love or game foo. In other words, valuing and understanding games, toys, and fairy tales, or a combination of these. Or yet again, possibly it's a causality, Harry's ability to love being related to his capacity to value what is considered childish and unimportant. You've been listening to Quantum Harry the Podcast, a podcast version of the book Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse by B. L. Purdom. All music heard on Quantum Harry is composed and performed by B. L. Purdom. To ask B. L. Purdom to be a guest on your podcast, send a Twitter direct message to at QH Podcast. Next time on Quantum Harry, 
Episode 11, War Games. When we continue looking at the role of toys, sweets, and games, especially Quidditch, in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. I hope you'll join me. Thank <laughs> you.